Well, I can finally say it. We have a good one today. You know, for a change. Journalist, author, a Temple University professor, Mark Lamont Hill joins me. He is the anchor of Black News Tonight, which I learned you don't have to be black to watch. In fact, you can get a lot out of watching Black News Tonight if you're not black. Now, uh, one thing I've learned watching Mark on Black News Tonight is that race is a social construct. And I, I'm going to let Mark explain that in this conversation because uh, he does that really well. In fact, he explains a lot of stuff really well, unlike my usual guests, I have to say. We discussed the war in Ukraine, which, of course, both Mark and I find appalling and wrenching, but Mark makes the point that Americans have been reacting to the, the horror there in a very different way than they did the similar atrocities that the Russians committed uh, in Aleppo, uh, Syria, and in other uh, theaters where the victims were not as, as white as Ukrainians. We've also seen the Poles react very differently to refugees coming out of uh, Ukraine who happen to be black. Uh, African grad students who have been studying in Ukraine, for example. Now, Mark is a student of critical race theory, and I first started watching uh, YouTube clips of him uh, debate the subject with uh, mainly idiots. And I'm kind of obsessed with critical race theory, as you might know, uh, because it is being used by Republicans in the most cynical and completely dishonest way. And uh, some people have said to me, Al, just stop talking about critical race theory. Republicans see that as, as a winning issue. Well, you know, I think uh, we need to understand what CRT is and call them out on it. I think it's the right thing to do. And I think it's the only way to beat these guys to expose their dishonesty. So I'm not going to stop. Okay, one last thing before we go to Mark Lamont Hill. Every once in a while, I have an idea for an SNL sketch. Okay, so Paul Begala, Tucker Carlson's old counterpart on Crossfire, calls uh, calls Tucker and he says, Tucker, the Russians keep playing the stuff you said praising Putin and you, you, you've gotten on the wrong side of this. And Tucker says, yeah, I know. And I don't know what to do. Begala says, I got a plan. It's a, it's a little crazy sounding, but it just might work. You get a hold of the Kremlin and tell them that you're a huge fan of Putin's and would like to come to the Kremlin and meet Putin and present him with the Carlson family gun. It's your most precious possession and you'd like to present it to him. And Tucker says, Paul, where are you going with this? Begala says, okay, you fly to Moscow, you go to Putin's office to present him with a gun, and just as he's thanking you for the gun, you shoot him in the head. And Tucker says, well, isn't that, isn't that suicide? Begala said, no, 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 they all hate Putin. It's just like the Wizard of Oz when Dorothy throws the bucket of water to put out the fire and the scarecrow, but it, it all goes on the Wicked Witch, and she melts. But instead, you'll be shooting Putin in the head and everyone will be thrilled and you'll be a hero. So Tucker likes the idea of being a hero, not just in Moscow as he is now, but all over the world. So he does exactly what Bogala told him to do, except when he's already in front of Putin with the gun, he chickens out. And the sketch ends with Tucker in a ticker tape parade in Moscow, uh, riding next to Putin. Okay, we'll be right back with Mark Lamont Hill. Where I first got interested in, in uh, watching you was critical race theory. Boogeyman. Because... <laughs> well, I, I hate, you know, I fucking hate the uh the mischaracterization of it and the, the abuse of it and i saw you had christopher uh rufo on 
yeah. who is sort of the guy, right? He's the guy who's been pushing this thing. And I noticed that you didn't use... He, he, he wrote something, and I, I guess this... Well, I don't know if it was a tweet or what it was. Uh, uh, the goal is to have the public read something crazy. You quoted this to other people, but not to him. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with America. Now, doesn't that sound really dishonest yeah. to you? <laughs> I mean, okay. You can, it's like one of those old TV shows, you know, where like the villain tells you his whole plan. And <laughs> I bet you didn't like it before. I almost didn't believe it was real. So, uh, okay, so let me ask you this, because I I love watching you interview people, and you also always, you very often bring on people who are publicly criticizing critical race theory and know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fun to watch those. Uh, but he, uh, Rufo knows shit, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he knows yeah. shit and knows can shit. articulate a decent response to you. It wasn't like the other nine tenths of the people you have on, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I I think that's the interesting part about him is that he knows just enough to to get it wrong, and he knows enough to confuse the public and 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 who want who you know who's open to being confused. And it, 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 actually, it, he knows more than enough to confuse people because people know nothing confuse people. Yes, that's true. <laughs> right. <laughs> All the time. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, young can confuse people by saying when, uh, when I become governor, that's the, le- you know, critical race theory stops being taught in our public schools. Right. So he knows young knows next to nothing, I would assume. Right. Bit, like. Yeah. So my question is, the thing I read to you that Rufo said, which is, as you say, it's the villain saying, here's my plan. Can I ask you why you didn't read that to him? You know, I, I actually, I think I, I came across that quote after I interviewed him. Oh. He, he was one of the early people that I interviewed. And I'll be honest, oh. the first time I saw that quote, I didn't think it was real. You thought someone had put it in his mouth. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, it, 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 it seemed impossible to me that someone would launch this kind of a plan and then announce what the plan is in public and in, in any venue, and, and then that the plan would be carried out. And, and it turned out that it was true, and I, I wish I had asked him about it. Um, uh, I see. I see. You hadn't uh, seen hadn't it, gotten yet. To it yet. No. Wow. Oh, have him on again. And yeah, I'll tell just, him. He ain't coming back <laughs> on, man. He, he, I, I've tried to get him back on. He won't. He won't engage me on Twitter. He won't respond. There's a few of them like that, you know, because because and that's how you know that they're that they're they have a nefarious intent. They 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 don't want good honest debate. When, once they think you can beat them, they stop coming on. And honestly, I think the first few, you know, they they didn't do their homework, so they assumed that I was just a TV host that didn't do the reading. Well, yeah. let's talk about your homework because this is this is a field you've studied, yeah, in great depth. So for my audience and for my purposes, could you tell me, tell us sort of what the uh, background of the critical race theory is and maybe start with the mischaracterization of it, which is what we're all familiar with. So that gives us a starting point right. <laughs> of what we've actually heard. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. And then cause I think I would like you to do this because I think it'd be the clearest explanation of all this that my audience has heard. I've yeah. tried. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do it, man. It's, it's funny uh, because even the liberals get it wrong sometimes. when they, Even when they're trying to defend it, they'll say, oh, critical race theory just means teaching the truth. And it's like, no, that's actually not what it is. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, okay, <laughs> I'm better than that. Yes, okay, but, <laughs> I'm giving, but I just want you to say yeah. what they're, they're, they're portraying it as what they're yeah. saying it as and, and give it a middle level. Don't give it the dumb, 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 dumb level, yeah. which you've had those people on very, very entertaining. Let, let, let me do this. Let, let me say what it is. And, and then yeah. it'd be easy to then say where people get it wrong. Okay. You it's know, your choice. Crit- critical race theory is, um, uh, 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 the theory. And it's a, it's a body of, of writing of, of academic writing 
that emerges in the 70s and the 80s, really, um, to help people understand the law. Um, whenever academics use the word critical, it doesn't just mean like to be to, crit to critique something. The word critical refers to power. Um, and so whenever you hear whether it's critical theory, critical race theory, critical feminism, it's always trying to figure out relationships of power, how the powerful become powerful, what keeps people powerful, et cetera. And there were a bunch of people in the law that's, who were studying the law in law schools that said, look, we got we to gotta figure out how the law benefits the rich. We got to figure out how the law benefits the power, you know, people who are in charge. Uh, and so you started to see something called critical legal studies. And critical legal studies was like the, the grandfather of critical race theory. It was like, hey, we got to figure out the law. Then, as is often the case, whether it's with trade unions, whether it's with, you know, whatever, there's a group of people who say, OK, you're progressive, you're radical even, but you forgot the black people. So let's think about how race plays into the conversation. Right. So let's not just think about how the law benefits the powerful and the landowners and the rich, et cetera. How does the law reinforce? And this is late 70s. Yeah, say. 70s. Uh, OK. Yeah, 70s. And this is this is uh, be, the reason it's in late 70s, I'd say, is because in the wake of the ad legal advances in the civil rights bill yeah, exactly. in 64, voting rights, 65, housing, et cetera. Why is this still so fucked up? That, that's literally the question people are asking. <laughs> yeah, okay. publicly, at least not in, in public. But yes, that is the question, right? How, how is it that if the law is now colorblind? In fact, this is the perfect question they asked, right? If the law is colorblind now, how are the outcomes not colorblind? And so what they, what they showed was that there are ways that America, American law is rooted in racism. And it's not as simple as just saying, well, let's make universal laws. And, and they also pointed out that sometimes universal laws are still targeted. You know, if if, if you have a grandfather clause at a, at a, at a, at a, uh, a voting booth and you say every, all Americans can vote as long as their grandfather voted. Yeah, that's cool if your grandfather wasn't a slave. Right. But, it, you know, or so. So the idea of. But that isn't the law now. There's when was that? Yeah. Last law. Right. That's how the cause of Jim Crow early 20th century. Right. But that was okay. the point. That was just that's just like an example of sort of how historically we've had laws that, that pretended to purported to be colorblind, but had a different impact. Uh, a more a more modern example would be uh, crack powder cocaine sentencing differentials. Right. That we saw w during the, the height of the war on drugs. It's like, OK, anybody who smokes or sells crack is going to get is going to get their ass handed to them. Anybody who does powder cocaine is going to be punished, but not quite as much. But it turned out that that had a differential impact based on race and class. And so, again, the, the law seemed to be colorblind, but that there was something about the law uh, that was still having a different impact. And so part of what the, the, the critical legal scholars were saying is maybe we should maybe colorblindness isn't the goal. Right. That that maybe treating people who are the treating people who are the same differently is awful. But so is treating people who are different as if they're the same. Right. And so maybe we have to look at how we're different and how we can attend to those differences. But basically what you're saying is there's racism. There's racism. <laughs> and, and, and that, right. Critical race theory is saying there's racism um, and that it's not it's not random. Right. It's not co it's not coincidental. That racist thing that happened is not it's not a one off. You know, it, there's there's a long standing deal here. Um, yes. The idea that when that that the, the advancements we see in society is the result of something called interest convergence. In other words, when the state's interests intersect with ours, that's when good things happen. Like um, the state doesn't just like slave masters didn't like retire, right? Like they weren't like you know what this shit is we're over it. Let's let's just give let's just let's just give people their rights back. And instead, there was a moment where Lincoln understood that the the best way to save the union was to end slavery. That's interest convergence, right? That that we didn't do it at a at a, a moral conversion. We did it because we had to. And then all the civil rights, all the advances we've seen are the product of interest convergence, right? So it, 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 it kind of sobers us up. We understand that race isn't real, that it's a social construction, right? This is what, and and explain that to me. It is a social construction. Race isn't real. Now, yeah. I think that's hard for, uh, it's hard for me to understand exactly what that means. So right. That's uh, a great question. I mean, so it's hard to understand it because it's, it feels real. Right. It, it looks real. Um, well, I know that, for example, uh, you had this guy, Christopher Rufo. I hate to keep going back to him, but he's Italian-American. Yeah. So he says, wait, well, I'm Italian-American. I'm not white. I go, you're white. Because <laughs> when people see you, they go, you're white.
And so that's a social construction because they maybe uh, Italians weren't considered white. They weren't. Neither were when Irish. They first came here. Yeah, and neither were Irish, right? And and we could look at people from. I mean, how like, white are the fucking Irish, by the way? Oh, They're right. really well, white. That's the irony of it, right? Yeah. They, <laughs> they, here, they, don't, they don't get membership, you know. But but the idea is to say that there are biological things. Of, all right, the biological difference between me and you uh, is in, minuscule, if not infinitesimal. Right? There's no real biological difference between black people and white people, right? That's not the issue. Um, there are phenotypic differences among different types. of I have different hair than you. I have different lips, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's biological and that's real. That's what people That's what people look at when they say, oh, race is real. I can, I can tell a black guy when he walks in the room. Of course you can, right? That's not the right. issue. The idea of categorizing people by those differences is something that we haven't always done. And it's not something that we necessarily do in the same way in every society. If I went to uh, the Caribbean if I were in the Spanish speaking Caribbean, there might be 10 different ways that we categorize people by color that wouldn't be the way we do in the United States. Uh, there are countries we could go to where people get racialized and they look exactly the same, you know? So, um, but, but there, there, are other categories, there are other things we do that, that force people to see themselves as a different race. And so the idea here is that, uh, is that, is that it's not that race is real and some people are just like racist. It's that the very idea of cre of categorizing people and dividing people by any sort is itself an act of race. Race is created by racism, by racists, not the other way around, ironically. And so when we say race is a social construct, it means that the meanings we attach to it. For, mm -hmm. it it's, it's like we would say with, the, with gender, right? When a, baby, when a baby is born and we decide to paint the room blue, there's nothing about babies that like the, the color blue, Right. But we we would. Are would you sure? <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But but the idea is, if, if the moment the baby's born, we give them blue and we give the girl pink, then at some point they start to think that those are boy and girl colors. That's the social construction. But some of the social meanings we give them are are, are constructed, and it's the same thing with race. And so when we say this, and, and so in America, what makes us different is is is, is being white or non-white. Right. Either you're white or you're not. White is the club that everybody wants to get into. The velvet rope is right on right outside of whiteness and everything else is we're trying to get. When Arabs came here, you know, they, they were characterized as non-white. They fought to be characterized legally as white, which has come back to bite them in the ass now. You know, as you see in all the fight, all the all the census fights, um, uh, you know, again, Irish people were outside of whiteness until they weren't, you know, um, and that's different than ethnicity. And that's what me and Rufo were arguing about. And that's the point that I'm making. Yeah, we all have different ethnicities. Right. You can be. You can be Irish, you can be Italian, you can be whatever, right? Um, but race is something different. And, and, and race is, is de determined by power dynamics. That's why when you ask a white person, what do you love about being white? Because he, he was saying that I define uh, whiteness as something negative. And my point is, whiteness as an idea is a construction of power. Not being Italian, you can name a million things you love about being Italian. You can name a million things you love about being uh, Russian, maybe not this week, but like in general, like you can name a million things you love about being Russian. But it's really tough to say what you love about being white unless you're talking about the things that you get that people who aren't white don't get, right? Or it's, 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 it's often about power dynamics. That's why there's an uneasy. One of the things, like my my daughter got some training. She she is uh, in public uh, DC public school system. And they got some training, and she said, "Dad, um, when you leave a store, do do you absolutely know where your receipt is?" And I said, "No." She said, that's the difference. Yes, exactly. If you're black, you go into a store and buy something, you kind of want to know where that receipt is. Uh, I keep it in my hand. Yeah, and that's that to me is really vivid yeah. and very clear. Right. You know, and what what bugs me is this, the people who are want, want to get critical uh, race theory prevented being taught in grade school, which it isn't. Right. <laughs> or, being or in junior school. high or in high school or in college. But right. um, is that they don't recognize that. Right. <laughs> they don't recognize that. They don't want to rec and, and, and and that's that's the point about um about whiteness that critical race theorists and, and some of the people who came after them have been trying to help people unpack is that whiteness is the thing that doesn't get outed. Whiteness is the norm, right? Whiteness just exists. It's like a fish in water, right? Um, and it's only when it's, 
examine in, in contrast or or in relation to something else, something non-white, that you begin to think about it, right? Because the truth is you shouldn't have to know where the receipt is when you walk out of the store. That ain't the problem, right? There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, people not walking up to you and saying, hey, Al, what, what's the white perspective on, you, you know, on this issue, right? There, there's nothing wrong with those things. Uh, there's, however, a problem as a person of color when you do have to know where the receipt is or when your actions get seen as the template for everybody else, right? No, they don't say, Republicans don't say, oh, we had a, we had a white president before, we can't do that again, right? If, 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 if Even if you think Kamala Harris is the worst VP ever, which I don't, but I'm saying even if someone thought that, to say, well, we went that route before, so why would we try a black woman to be a Supreme Court judge, which is what a conservative commentator said a few a month or two ago, um, the idea that one black person's actions uh, dictate our, our response to all black people is something that black people deal with, not white people. And so when we talk about white privilege, that's what we're talking about. It's not that white people get stuff that they shouldn't get. It's that they get stuff uh, in a society that others don't get. And the thing that gets them that stuff is their whiteness. And so whiteness has power. Whiteness, as critical race theorists say, argues as a form of property. And that's the dangerous part. And so critical race is, is just trying to unpack that stuff. Now, Well, if you, if you look at, for example, when the FHA started redlining, Created red lines. People yeah. don't realize this. Uh, Heather McGee has been on uh, our, my podcast a couple times and pointed out that it was the FHA that created redlining. Yep. And that was uh, in the New Deal right away. Uh, Roosevelt said, find a way to get people housed again. Yeah. And they, so let's lend to people <laughs> and let's not lend to people who, you know, we want this to be a success. Right. They just unconsciously just went, OK, in the black areas uh, won't lend there because they'll be less likely to be able to. Pay. And, and there was no evidence. There was no research done of that. That's what that's how red line was created by the federal government. Yep. And that kind of still exists. Oh, for sure. I mean, not kind of. It still <laughs> exists. Right. And it still exists when. uh you know, you, you go to a neighborhood and you're trying to, and, and a realtor is selling to a black family. Uh, there are people in that white neighborhood are going, getting a little nervous about the value. Yes. That exists. So the idea that that with, with the people who are, are so angry about critical race theory is they're saying like, from now on, from this moment on forward, it doesn't exist. We're just going to pretend it doesn't exist so that you're judged just by the content of your character. As Martin Luther King said, he told us that. I, I wish white people could lose that speech. That's the, it's like, that's the one, it's like, it's like white people listening to Bob Marley all know like one love, you know, and they don't just, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was one part of a speech in which he was saying that there was a check due to black people, right? Yeah. That was the whole point of damn speech. Right. Yeah. Because they were black. You know, it's like yeah. he wasn't being colorblind when he said, give us, give us the, I came to the nation's capital to cash a check. And, and you know, and, and yeah. so that, that's the that's the idea here is that, is that we have to think about how the law and government and all these structures reflect and reinforce uh, what uh, the racism, structural racism. And so... That's happening in law school, and then it's also happening in some graduate schools. Some again, people right. who train to be teachers often get exposed to critical race theory. That's a very common yeah. thing in schools of education. And then on this other side, there are these Republicans who are screaming that the the sky is falling because they think that somehow this sophisticated theory and these ideas are being taught in in elementary school. Now, are there uh, is race being talked about in elementary school? Yeah. Is um, is multiculturalism being taught? Sure. Are, are certain narratives of history being corrected? Absolutely. Uh, but that's not critical race theory. And so the first thing we have to do is say, OK, what you're saying is happening isn't happening. And the reason and the reason they want to attach critical race theory to this, because people will say, well, why does it matter if it's called critical race theory? If they're teaching the, the terrible stuff that they're teaching terrible stuff, you, you're, you, you, you lefties are focusing on the on the words critical race theory and not the idea. But they're doing something very strategic. They they know that when they use the word critical and they attach the word critical in these tra academic traditions, it's a hop, skip and a jump to a red scare. And that's what they're really trying to do. They're trying to make you feel 
that that this Marxist that this Marxist strand of thinking is entering into critical race theory. Now, if you're a Marxist, cool, that's a different conversation. But critical race theory fundamentally isn't even rooted in Marxism. It, that, that, you know, just because you hear the word critical doesn't mean that it's coming out of Frankfurt, Germany, you know, post World War II, right? Um, there's actually a very different tradition that it's in conversation with. But that's what they're trying to. And they did the same thing when Obama was elected in 08. And they, they said, oh, my God, there's Jeremiah Wright. And he's teaching liberation theology. And that's Marxist Christian Christianity. And they're trying to make, to make and they're saying that Jesus is racist and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And they're turning the pulpit into a political sphere. They do the same thing. Their playbook is very simple, you know, um, and it, it's to take a random academic theory, attach it to a political moment and make white people feel like their whiteness is, ironically, their whiteness is in jeopardy and that their status in America is in jeopardy by virtue of that. And they got to, and they better go vote like hell to get rid of it. Well, that's basically what he was saying is that uh, we, we uh, take things that people read in the newspaper and get scared. And then uh, we decodify the term and recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with America. Yeah. I mean, that's, exactly what they're doing and he said it. it's the villain saying exactly what they're doing uh let, let's move on to uh let's talk about ukraine and i you said something very recently about the way uh people are reacting improperly to the outrage and the, the this monstrous thing that's happening in ukraine but didn't and then you named a few theaters of war. Yeah. My specifically would be Syria, because the, the Russians are doing this exactly in Aleppo. Yes. And, and uh, we didn't really get hysterical about it. No. And so I think your point was, why didn't we get hysterical about that? And now we're getting hysterical about Ukraine. Yeah. And I think that, that's a very good point. <laughs> and, I, and I think the point is, uh, we, we Syrians, uh, not so white. I think that's a big, you know, it, 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 I think there's a few things. I don't want to oversimplify it and make it seem like, you know, white, white people, white people die bad, black people, brown people die. We don't care. Although I think that's not the worst <laughs> framing of it. That, that ain't far off. But well, I, you name some theaters where it is, to me, it is a different thing. Yes. Like Somalia. Sure. You know, Al-Shabaab. Those they were they were black. It yeah. wasn't the United States going in. Uh, in Afghanistan, we got attacked from right. Afghanistan, and we were as misguided as the last twenty years of staying there was. There was a reason we at least thought we were going in there. Iraq, we were just lied into it. I mean, you know, right. but there's, there's that. <laughs> But there's 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 multiple pieces to this, right? The first thing I was pointing to was the kind of uh, self righteous indignation and outrage. Oh my God, people are contravening international law. We support countries that contravene international law. We fund some of them. We do trade with many of them. We remain we are them. Yeah, so. we are them. In, in, in <laughs> yeah. We, okay. right. So so Have the been. first piece of it, been. right? So some of those countries I was naming, it wasn't necessarily even about our response to it as much as it is our policy disposition toward it. I mean, to watch the United States engage Saudi Arabia, just to give you one example, right? I mean, if, if you look at what Saudi Arabia is doing and has done, the fact that we can we can cry. cry in cry, Yemen? Cry. Are you talking about Yemen? Yemen in, Ye in Yemen. By the way, I was one of the first senators to speak out about that and end, try to end that uh, arms from to Saudi Arabia, they're going to be used there. It was like, believe it or not, Rand Paul was one of the others. Which is stunning. It is, and that, but it was, it's true. And uh, Chris Murphy. It was like three of us. Right. You're, you're, you're yelling in the wilderness about Saudi Arabia because we have an economic interest in Saudi Arabia. We have a strategic positioning. What would that be? Uh, oh, oil, oil. Oh, I'm sorry. That, 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 that thing is, well, is, it, is, it, is it cotton? No, no, it's that's right. It's oil. That's it. That's right. You know, if, if Saudi Arabia had been had been sending weapons to Yemen prior to 1973, we would have a very different conversation going right now. Uh, you know, but because of because of what's going because of that, we don't care. We we talk about women's rights, right? 
and and we we've literally used the 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 language of of feminism and women's rights and Operation Iraqi Freedom was about liberating all the people, but especially those women. Afghanistan, we talked about, we got to get the women out of those burqas. Uh, um, and all that's happening, and yet we are working with MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, we're working in Saudi Arabia. The most progressive feminist moment in, in Saudi Arabia in the last five years is women not having to wear the, the abaya, the overgarment, right? The, the fight for, I, I've seen women arrested and jailed for fighting for the right to drive. We see journalists attacked, killed. I mean, look at uh, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, right? So all this stuff is happening, and we have no outrage for it. And, and but so, by the, even in terms of their domestic affairs, much less when you look at what they do, what, what's happening in Yemen and Bahrain, etc. We have nothing to say about it. Um, Israel's relationship to, to, the, to the Palestinian people is is a persistent violation of of human rights uh, and, and, and international law. Uh, and when Donald Trump stands up and says, "You and I, I might might have a, a more nuanced discussion about that," but, but, but I'm sure we we, we might. But but, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but but even if you yeah. don't even if you don't take my position on the Palestinian, and people, I agree, but it'd be more nuanced in the agreement. But, 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 so I just don't want that to stand. No, no, with. and and that's and that's fine. But 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 if but even if you just talk about recognizing the embassy. If, if, even if you just talk talking about the acknowledgement of Jerusalem as contested, East Jerusalem as contested, right? That is a very clear. There's a very clear international consensus on that, except for that 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 last president guy who decides, you know what? I will move the embassy to Jerusalem. I mean, the, these are like clear acts that that no that no one seems to, to to acknowledge. So so those are the things I'm thinking about. If if so, there's the policy piece. Then there's the people are getting. Oh my God, people are getting bombed. Guess what? People get bombed all the time, and it's always awful. Right. Three countries got bombed last week or, you know. But here's that. the difference, I would say, with yeah. and I'll go back to Somalia because uh, big Somali community in Minnesota. And uh, then again, that was basically an offshoot of ISIS or of okay. yeah. uh, attacking people, you know, and it, it, it was uh, black people bombing black people. And um, so little different and and that was uh you know radical islam i'd say uh against not <laughs> radical islam but but as opposed to what it, the hell is fucking putin this is russia calling them nazis right. denazifying ukraine i mean we know this is as wrong as you get right yeah Oh, it is. There's nothing wronger than this. This may be things equally wrong, but this is right. This is textbook wrong. Yeah, this, this, yeah, is, this, this is, is yeah, wrong. yeah. But that, but but Alex, that's the point, right? Is that um, we're we're saying it's wrong because it's clear. Although even if they're not using the language of colonialism, it's it's clear imperial or imperialism. It's clear imperialism. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, they're saying basically Ukrainians are Russians anyway, right? I mean, that, that's Putin's kind of one of his narratives is. You know, we've always had this relationship with Ukraine. They are fundamentally Russian, and 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 basically annexation and and and, and boundaries and, and and borders are irrelevant because this is all ours, really, right? Um, and then there's the the the, the language of, of destroying uh, white nationalism. We're going to denazify the area. I mean, all this stuff is is part of a discourse that is, like you said, 100% wrong. And I'm glad that the international community is outraged by it, but I do think they should be equally outraged. When Al Shabaab is is terrorizing everyday Somalians, right? Um, well, we were fighting Shabaab. I mean, we were the United States was yeah. fighting Shabaab in Somalia and it's, it's, going after them. It's, it's, so that we were on the right side of that. It was just yeah, very. That's why, I made, that's why I made the distinction, right? There's the government response, right, which is a policy disposition, which sometimes we're 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 of two minds, three minds, four minds on it. Then I'm saying there's the actual general public and media response, right, which doesn't have the same outrage or feel the same sense of victimhood. So even if we're fighting al-Shabaab on Somali land, the public doesn't give a shit. Everyday people don't give a shit. Well, what was complicated about it, of course, was fucking Trump and fucking Cruz and fucking those fucking people were telling uh, Minnesotans that Somalis who had come to Minnesota who were contributing to our state right our were were terrorists yeah. and literally saying that yeah. oh. you've suffered enough that's what 
the one time Trump came and campaigned in Minnesota in 16, he lands at the airport the weekend before the election, says, you people have suffered enough because we let these people in. Exactly. And, and he used that, again, to justify, that logic was, was used to justify blocking refugees, basically an anti-Muslim yeah. refugee act, right? From Syria. From, from I mean, Syria, from yeah. Somalia, from, um, uh, where else? From uh, Afghanistan, from uh, from uh, from Sudan, not from Egypt, right? Not from Saudi. I mean, this is fascinating, right? We're so we're worried about terrorism. Let, let's 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 buy his argument, right? We we're terrified of terrorism, and terrorism seems to only come from Muslims, right? If you're genuinely <laughs> terrified about 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 Islamic jihad, if you're genuinely afraid that all Muslims are terrorists, the birthplace yeah. of, of 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 Wahhabism, uh, Saudi Arabia, the birthplace of of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood, Egypt. You some, they somehow make it so, so it's always been a political choice it's never been about a real fear of muslims or, or 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 only about a real fear of muslims and a genuine fear that that's the problem and so for me the american public the american government has its own selective outrage but then the american public it seems to me in the media doesn't have very much sympathy for people who are not white and when you look at just to give you the 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 the, the example that the, the the string of, of sound bites that were cobbled together over the last few weeks about Ukraine, where you have people saying, uh, you know, this isn't supposed to happen here. This is a civilized country. This is Ukraine. Or these are white people. This isn't some third world country. Who, now, who actually said that? So CBS, uh, their, their senior uh, foreign correspondent, Charlie uh, Diagata, said uh, Ukraine isn't a place with all due respect like Iraq or Afghanistan uh, that has seen conflict raging for decades. This is a relatively civilized, relatively European, I have to choose those words carefully, Ooh. city, one where wouldn't ex one, one where you wouldn't expect that or hope that or hope that it's going to happen. And that's him using his words carefully. Um, this idea of, of calling this place civilized, right? That there's a sense that this shouldn't happen here, which is fine, it shouldn't. But the idea that it should happen somewhere else, the BBC, to give you one more example, said it's very, uh, 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 the BBC interviewed a former deputy prosecutor general of Ukraine who says, it's very emotional for me because I see European people with blue eyes and blonde hair being killed every day. That's why he was saying that's why he was upset. And the host replies back, I understand and respect the emotion, right? In France, somebody said, we're not talking here about Syrians fleeing the bombing of the Syrian regime backed by Putin. We're talking about Europeans leaving in cars that look like ours to save their lives. I guess the closest you could come <laughs> to defending that is it's an honest reportage of an emotion you're not proud of i wish or something like that or I like wish. it's reporting something like holy this looks like my family leaving yeah. uh westchester county right and, and and that's where the construction of race can become really tr troublesome right because that's that's why that's why people can see Katrina victims as 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 looting and. and but you could say this looks like the Obamas leaving. <laughs> you know, very successful upper middle class, upper you know, very successful people leaving in their nice car. Right, I identify with that too. Exactly, Except that's what they might have meant. Hey, I mean, you—that's a Beacom yoga stretch right there. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I I wish they were being that generous. I mean, the truth is. I, um, I like to cut people who are being unconsciously racist a little slack. That's a that's an interesting hobby. I I, I... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yes, I like that. I, I, I think it's important to recognize those those unconscious subconscious statements of racism. I think they matter and I think they're important to do because they tell us something. Um Yeah. They tell us exactly what critical race theory is, in a way, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. in so many ways. Yeah, in so many ways, and because we we will literally create policy that will make it harder for a Syrian than a Ukrainian to get relief or to get support, and we'll base it on something other. We won't say it's because of race. It'll be yeah, a, it'll be a racially neutral policy, but the but the ultimate outcome will be um, this race. And the reason is because we have some something deep inside of us that makes us think that when there's a shooting in Chicago you know, it, or, it, over the weekend, all of us, including some black folk are like, eh, that's kind of what happens there, right? When you hear famine in Africa, you're like, eh, that's kind of what they, that's kind of their jam, right? But 
But if there's a famine in France or a shooting in Nutria, Illinois, or, you know, or, 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 or God forbid, Sandy Hook, like we saw, we're outraged and upset as we should be, but we can't muster that same for other people because we live in a world where to be white is to be human and to be human is to be white. My, my, my point is just, we have a different uh, threshold for black misery than we do white misery. And, and brown misery and 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 uh, then white misery in this country and really in this world, and I, and I think that when we look even Al Jazeera, I mean, who I work for, you know, we, we one of, one of our reporters said something very similar, like, oh shit, this is happening over there, you know, um, it's it's tough, man, and 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 it, it it speaks to a deeper problem that we we have to be honest about. We have to we have to really be honest about what our deepest. Uh, most coveted assumptions about the world are and how we can unlearn them. And I would argue one of the best places to unlearn that is school, right? If I walk into an elementary school and these kids are learning that, yeah, we all have a race, but like my race doesn't make me more human than you. It doesn't make you more human than me. It doesn't make me better or smarter or anything just because my skin is white or black or brown or whatever. That's a great start. But the outrage from the right is teaching a book like Skin Like Me, which just tells people that race is a thing, it exists in the world and it's not uh, it's not biologically real, but it socially matters. They're acting as if we're teaching that we're teaching the Communist Manifesto, you know, and, and the 10 point platform of the Black Panther Party. And it's like, no, we're actually just identifying race as a very real thing. And people are so afraid of race talk that they eliminate all of it. And so when we see these critical race uh, pieces of legislation, the anti-critical race theory legislations passing in, in all these states, what they're doing, they're not banning law, law theory. They're not banning uh, Derek Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw or Delgado or Solorzano, all these people that most people don't know. What they're doing is they're banning race talk from school. They're making it so we can't talk about race at all. We can't talk about difference at all. I, I like the Florida law that DeSantis proposed, which is that uh, you can sue a teacher if, they, if the teacher makes a kid feel uncomfortable, discomfort. <laughs> <laughs> about the race and it's just and i you know i'm just thinking what what is it like teaching american history in florida after that law happens which is how do you what you say well um for about the first 250 years there were certain people who worked for free <laughs> and no tj not like your unpaid uh, internship at your dad's law firm. <laughs> it wasn't that like was a Valley internship. <laughs> <laughs> that was voluntary. And why are you crying, Ashley? You know, I mean, that's, um, it's amazing. It's amazing and very disturbing. And, and, and it's, ca- and it's catching on. I mean, it's, it's all over the place, right? How many states are doing this? Shit? Absolutely. And, 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 and somehow again, that, the language of making people uncomfortable sounds neutral. It sounds like, oh shit, I don't want anybody to be uncomfortable, right? I don't. Any, that's not about white people. That's just for everybody. But we know, and in social studies class, who's more likely to be uncomfortable? Who's more likely to be uneasy by the lesson, by by a proper history lesson? And it doesn't mean that black people won't ever be uncomfortable. But what it means is that that's not the target of the legislation. That's not what we're expecting. I mean, a conversation about slavery could make a black person uncomfortable, right? But that's not what the legislation is is is, um, is about. And they know no black person is going to call the school district and say, you know, you're teaching my kids that their ancestors were enslaved. Please stop it. It's much more likely that they're going to say, uh, we got a call from a white parent who doesn't want to hear uh, that their ancestors were the enslavers. And that's what they're trying to ban. That's what they're trying to stop. Or... You know, if you grew up in Oklahoma and didn't hear about Tulsa. Right. Right. You know, how is that possible? You have to teach our history. Right. And you, and you can't sure. teach it through the passive. You can't say, you know, you know, like the, the newspaper will do when certain people get killed. They'll be like, oh, five uh, soldiers or five youth were killed as opposed to five people killed these people. Right. So so we can't go through history and say, well, you know, some black people were enslaved by somebody. You know, so there was some slavery happening. You know, the, these Sioux were, were, were killed uh, without pointing out who the killers were, without talking about settler colonialism, without talking about uh, white supremacy, without talking about uh, uh, slavery. We have to actually name things. And it's in the naming that the discomfort comes. And so they're trying to take away our power to name 
they're trying to take our way our power to narrate history properly and we got to fight like hell to hold on to that right if we want to have any chance of a progressive future uh mark thank you so much this has uh, really been fun and a pleasure and illum illuminating all of those at one time that's what we strive for here oh man it's, it's, a, it's fun it's, I, i'm a longtime fan of your work and i'm, I'm so excited and, and and happy and proud to be on the show can i do a quick uh shameless plug yeah yeah i, I have a book coming long out. as it's shameless it's, uh, i i know no other way <laughs> I have a book coming out in May. It's called Seen and Unseen, uh, uh, Technology, Social Media, and the Fight for Racial Justice. It's about how, uh, not just how social media and technology has shaped the way or reshaped the way we talk about uh, racism in America and justice, but how that's always been the case from, from the times of birth of a nation through, the, through Ida B. Wells, you know, writing about lynching to right now with George Floyd and the camera phone. So everybody, if you can order the book, pre-order the book, anywhere books are sold, that would be amazing. Seen and unseen, technology, uh, social media, and the fight for social justice. Well, I am, I'm going to pre-order that myself. I appreciate that. I hope you can come back for that one. Absolutely. <laughs>